Happy Sabbath again. Let's try that one more time. Happy Sabbath. There we go. You guys are a little bit uh, deceptive. You know, at some point, you know, you come up and you say, okay, there's three people out there. And then you get to 1130 and, you know, like 50 more people show up. <laughs> Church starts at 1045, by the way. <laughs> I'm joking, but it does. And Sabbath school starts at 930 if you'd like to come for that, too. But God is good. Amen. And I don't mean to shame you. I was just kind of making an observation. But it's good to see you. Amen. And as I said before, it's great to be back in the dare after a month of camp meeting and, and being away and taking some time off a uh, week before last just to visit with my wife's family. And we're tired still. <laughs> Have vacation Bible school and a lot of other things. But God is good to us. And I hope he's been good to you. Amen. Uh, we're going to continue. And actually, we could still take some echo out of the, the mic and maybe take it down a little bit. We're still continuing through the book of book of Acts. Is that better? You still hear me? Okay, great. And we are have been focusing in on how God is using his church and his people to make contact with and reach those who are unreached and unsaved. And so this these last two weeks I've been studying a certain message, thinking it was going in a certain direction. I know Randy prayed about the Holy Spirit changing that direction, and yesterday it changed, or at least by last night, I'm thinking, okay, what just happened? Where did the message go? Because as a pastor, you feel a burden, and you, there's, a, there's a, an energy that comes with the messages when God gives them to you, and so this morning, he gave me something similar, but something different, and so I know for sure that what is spoken today uh, is coming from the Lord, something he wants us to hear and understand about our responsibility to reach out after those in this world who are not saved and who don't know Jesus. So I'm going to pray, and I always ask that you please pray uh, with me and for me, and pray for yourself. And say, Lord, please speak to my heart this morning. I challenge our young people as well. Uh, that this is not a time to tune out, not a time to, to do something else. This is a moment where you ask the Holy Spirit to speak uh, to you as well, and to make this relevant to you as a young person. And then please pray for me that every word I speak comes directly from Jesus. Amen. Father in heaven, we rejoice to be able to come freely into your presence this morning. We thank you for the Sabbath. We thank you for this time of worship. And Father, it is now your time to speak to us through your son Jesus, through your word, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I humble myself. I just desire to see Jesus high and lifted up. I desire for your word to penetrate my heart and to enter into the hearts and minds of your people who are waiting and listening for a word from the Lord. So, Father, in all humility and with lowliness, we just uh, come to you as little children begging for bread, and we ask that you please feed us to the full. We pray, Lord God, that you provide us a feast through your word, but also that you would transform and change and convict our hearts, that you would not leave us the same. But even if maybe our hearts are hardened through something that happened this week, and maybe we're just here out of obligation, whatever it might be, I pray that today some soul would walk out of here with a new lease on life and a new lease on eternal life and a connection with you. So, Father God, glorify yourself and your son through your word, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, turn with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 13. Acts 13. And when you get there, you can let me know by saying amen. Acts 13, and join me at verse 14 and 15. I'll read those just to kind of get a context for where uh, the sermon is going this morning and really the context for the, whole, the rest of the chapter, and we'll see what God has to say about us and the unreached. So verse 14 of Acts 13 says, But when they, speaking of Paul and Barnabas, departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia. And went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them or came to them saying, you men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation or encouragement for the people, say on or go ahead and speak. Now, this is a common occurrence that's taking place here in Acts, which doesn't really happen very much in our day or in our churches. In the synagogue, 
uh, there was a certain ruler, or one person, maybe like a head elder, who would kind of govern and lead out in the church services. And if he noticed during the service that there was someone there, maybe a rabbi, someone who uh, was well known for speaking and bringing the word, they would ask that individual on the spot if they would be the speaker for that morning. And so how would you like to come to church not knowing if you're going to be called on to be the preacher that day? It means you better study up, pray up, have a word on your lips because you might be called on. Actually, I might do that one day. I'll keep you guys on your toes. Or it may thin out the congregation. I don't know. One or the other. But Paul and Barnabas were there that day, and they recognized, you know, Paul, of course, was trained under one of the most uh, decorated rabbis and one of the most uh, powerful teachers of his time. And so they knew who he was. And so they asked him to go ahead and bring the message that morning. And Paul got up and spoke. And for the next few verses, Paul uh, eloquently and powerfully spoke on his most favorite subject and most favorite theme, and that is the life of Jesus Christ. He dealt with Jesus through a prophetic lens, looking at Christ coming from the lineage of David and eventually showing up to be the savior of the world. He deals with Jesus and his crucifixion, his rejection by Pilate, his rejection by the Jewish nation. He also deals with Jesus's uh, resurrection. And so he covers the whole basis and he's talking to Jews and Gentiles who actually were, these Gentiles were folks who were not necessarily Jews, but they were interested in Judaism because they were sitting in a synagogue on the Sabbath day. So they knew they were in for a religious uh, service or religious ceremony. And so Paul is talking about Jesus. He's going on about Christ's life. And basically his whole goal was to encourage these Jews who really didn't believe Jesus was a Messiah to accept him as Messiah and to accept the salvation that Jesus is bringing. He's also speaking to these Gentiles who are proselytes, who who are, you know, getting to know what Judaism was all about. And he's encouraging them to accept Jesus as the Savior, as the Messiah. As a matter of fact, look at verse 38, where he finally gets to the, the core of what Jesus did for them and what Christ has done for us. And he says in verse 38, be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So Paul is clearly addressing the Jews and their thinking that they could somehow work themselves to salvation, that by keeping the law of Moses, a strict account of what they were doing for God, that somehow they could be saved. And he's essentially leveling that argument and saying, you can't be saved by anything you do. You cannot be saved by making yourself perfect or making yourself better. Salvation comes by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. That does not mean that now a person is able to live the kind of life that they want to live and still be saved. There's actually a, something I came across this week. There's a preacher who talks about the gospel of inclusion. And it's no different than what universalists believe or what people might term universal salvation, which says it doesn't matter who you are and what your background is and what religion you are and what your belief system is. Jesus died for all and therefore everyone, no matter what, no conditions will be saved. So the gospel of inclusion is just this new term that this gentleman is uh, preaching that a lot of Christians and a lot of uh, Christian outlets are picking up on, which simply says, you know, the child molester, and if, even if they persist in that, and the rapist and the murderer will have the exact same reward as the saint and the Christian who comes to church every single week, faithfully gives to God and does Christian acts of mercy and prays to God and reads their Bible. They're both going to have the same end, salvation. Well, I wouldn't know if I'd say amen. <laughs> Only because the gospel is inclusive. The gospel includes everyone. Jesus died for how many? For all? He didn't just die to save Seventh-day Adventist Christians. He didn't just die to save Jews. He didn't die just to save the poor. Jesus died for every single human being on this earth. The gospel itself is inclusive, but the gospel is something that must be received. It must be accepted. Jesus must be adopted into the life. The Holy Spirit must be asked for. The Bible must be sought for and read. You know, Jesus doesn't just offer salvation uh, he offers it freely, but he does not give it freely to those who reject it. So how will Jesus give salvation to someone who doesn't even want Jesus in their lives? So it's interesting that that is pushing itself through Christianity, where people just believe it doesn't matter who you are, how you live, what you do, you can be saved no matter what. He corrected it. So 
Paul is making it clear in verse 38 and 39 that it's Jesus who forgives us, and if we believe in him, he freely makes us innocent and cleansed from everything we've ever done. Aren't you glad for what Christ has done for you? Aren't you happy that Jesus, because of the sacrifice that he made, is willing to forgive your sins, no matter how deep and how dark your, the record of your life is, that Christ accepts you as you are because you're his child? Isn't that beautiful what the gospel does and what the grace of God does for us and the love of God and how it embraces every single person no matter who they are? And that's one reason why we have to be very careful not to look at other people and their sins and measure our lives, which we think might be more pristine than their lives. Everyone has fallen under the condemnation of sin and all of us without Jesus would be lost. There is no sin that is necessarily greater or less than another. There are different measurements of punishment depending on what that sin might be. But all of us fall short of the glory of Christ. We should all be humbled when we become followers of Jesus. Because if it weren't for the grace of God, we'd be in the exact same position as the common sinner. Praise God for what Jesus has done. So Paul is going on about this, and it's interesting, both the Jews and the Gentiles who were at church that day were excited about what they were hearing. They said, we want to hear more. Come back the next Sabbath and preach to us. The Bible says that Paul and Barnabas encouraged the, the individuals who were following them. They came back the next Sabbath, and it says almost the entire city came to hear what these men were going to say. As a matter of fact, if you look at verse 44, the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Wouldn't it be nice if we opened up our doors one day and the whole city of Madeira was clamoring to get in? You know, God could do that if he wanted to. I thought the sermon was going in a direction where I was going to deal with why he doesn't and why he hasn't sent people to our doors clamoring to get inside of our church. But maybe it's for another day. But these people wanted to hear the word of God. They were so hungry. They were longing for something deeper, something more. They wanted to hear the gospel. But interestingly, in verse 45, it says, But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and with jealousy. And they spoke against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. One reason why they were doing this is because they'd been sitting in that synagogue for Sabbath after Sabbath after Sabbath. And they'd had a couple of Gentiles come in and get interested. But they hadn't had the whole city come in. These strangers come in from nowhere, and the very next Sabbath, the whole church is full, and people are hanging out of the windows wanting to hear the gospel of Christ. The second reason why is because when Paul is preaching the gospel, he's preaching not the gospel of inclusion, but he's preaching that the gospel is inclusive of even these Gentiles, and what the gospel does is it puts them on the exact same level of the Jews, and they weren't having that. Because there ain't no way. We are the chosen people of God. We are number one. We are more valuable to God than anyone else. These sinners and these Gentiles could be lost, and it wouldn't matter anything to the universe. That was their mindset. There's no way these Gentiles, these common sinners, these idolaters, even if they're interested in our faith, are going to be on the exact same level as us. Which also means we must be humble as Seventh-day Adventists and recognize that God has people in a lot of churches who are faithful to him, and they don't have the light that we have, some of them a lot more zealous for God than we are, more faithful to God than we are, more down for God than we are, more sacrificial for God than we are. God has called us as a special people, a chosen people, and I'm going to tell you why in just a moment and make it very clear but he's not called us because we're better. Even the Jews were not called because they were better. He says that your, your father was a Syrian about to die, talking about Abraham. He said, I didn't call you because you were better than the other nations. You were the fewest people in number, and that's why I called you. Because God knew if he chose some great nation like Egypt, Egypt gets the glory. He chose some small, insignificant people who became a race of slaves that become a really great people, and the Jews don't get the glory, God gets it. He always chooses the small things, the little things, the weak things, of this world to simple things to confound the wise, like he did with Ellen White. She was some lady with a fourth grade education who's a 17-year-old girl who is fraught with sickness, and he chooses her to be a prophet for the Lord. Even the two individuals that rejected God's call to be prophets before Ellen White accepted it were individuals who had been looked down upon, who would have been insignificant in society, so that God gets the glory and not them. 
So the whole city comes together. The Jews are upset and they're angry. In verse 46, Paul and Barnabas became bold and said, if necessary, the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so has the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set you to be a light of the Gentiles, that you should be for the salvation or be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Now, this is a quote coming from the book of Isaiah. And actually, if you would turn with me to Isaiah 49. I want to show you this quote in context that Paul is using that he says God commanded us to make sure we are a light to this entire world. And Paul accepted that responsibility personally. But I want us to look briefly at this. Isaiah chapter 49. Some of you probably have a note that says Isaiah 42, 6. It is there, but there's also, it's also repeated in Isaiah chapter 49. And if you would turn there with me. And I'm going to read a few verses around the text that come, that's from Acts. And starting at verse 5 in Isaiah 49. You there with me? And now, in verse 5, now says the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob, or Israel, again to him, though Israel is not yet gathered, yet will I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God will be my strength. And he said, it is a light thing, or is it a light thing, that you should be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give you for a light to the Gentiles that you may be my salvation to the end of the earth. Verse 7. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to him who, who man despises, to him whom the nation abhors, to a servant of rulers. Kings will see and arise. Princes also will worship because of the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, and he will choose you. Now, reading this initially, who do you think Isaiah is talking about? He's talking about Jesus. He's saying, Jesus, you, God is saying, you are my servant. You are the one I've chosen. You are the one that I watched over and formed there in a virgin's womb. You are the one that I gave to be my salvation and my light until all the way into the extremity of the earth. You are the one that the nation despises and abhors. It's interesting that Jesus is the most loved and most hated figure in all of human history. Did nothing wrong, no crimes, hurt no people, and yet he's the most hated figure in all of history, and yet the most loved, and I can understand why. It seems like Jesus is more hated than Hitler sometimes. But Jesus is that servant that God raised up, and he would be the light to the Gentiles. He would be the one that would show the salvation of God to the entire world. Now, it's interesting that when Paul is quoting this, who is Paul saying is the one that was chosen to do this work? Paul said God commanded us. Talking about him and Barnabas specifically, and maybe the Christian church generally. Watch what's happening here. Jesus is appointed or given an assignment in Isaiah 49 to be a light and salvation unto the end of the world. Paul in Acts 13 takes Jesus' assignment and appropriates it to himself and says, Jesus' assignment is my assignment. Jesus being the light to the world is my assignment to be the light to the world. Jesus' purpose of reaching the Gentiles and the unsaved of the world is my assignment to be a light, to reach the unsaved and the unreached in this world. Do you get it? Now, I know you know where this is going because I'm pointing at myself. But the moment I turn that finger this way, we get a little bit nervous. Because what it's saying is that Jesus' assignment is your assignment, and it's your assignment, and it's your assignment. That you would show God's salvation and his light unto the uttermost part of this world. That you would show the power of Jesus, the cross of Christ, the life of Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the law of God, all the things that, that accompany the power of the word of God. God is saying what was given to Jesus has been given to you. The church in general, you specifically. 
Paul understood this. And he says, that prophecy is for me. What Jesus is supposed to accomplish, I must accomplish. Now, I said I have you a little bit nervous and I have your attention because you think I'm going to call you to something that is difficult that you may not necessarily want to do because I honestly believe, and I'm coming to this conclusion more and more, that the very thing that the church was raised up to do is the one thing that most of us cringe to do. It's easy to come to church and sit in a pew and listen to sermons. It's easy to come to prayer meeting, kind of, because less people come. It's kind of easy to give a dollar into the offering plate, a little less easy to give your tithe. It's easy to show up to the church socials. It's easy to take some glow out maybe here and there. It's easy to go to camp meeting, listen to powerful sermons. We as human beings want the path of least resistance. The most difficult thing for us to do is the one thing that we've been really called to do, and that is reach the unsaved. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2. You still with me? I can hear some crickets in here. I just had to make sure that somebody was out there. Philippians 2. And look at verse 12. This same Paul, who is taking Jesus' assignment and says, What Christ is called to do, I'm called to do. Verse 12 of Philippians 2, Paul is saying, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, because it is God that works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and disputing, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked or a warped and perverse nation among whom you shine as what? Lights in the world. Follow Paul's train of thought. Number one, he's saying your number one priority from verse 12 is to make sure that you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's priority number one, is that you are connected to Jesus and you you have accepted him as Lord and personal Savior of your life. Amen. When he's saying that work out your own salvation, he's not going into, you know, works. We as Adventists may be very prone to that. And at one point in time, we were really prone to to salvation by works. We recognize this by grace through faith through Jesus alone. What he's saying is it is that you must complete, allow God to complete the work of salvation in you, but you must cooperate with him to have it done. I have a cousin that likes to say, I wish God would just take over my body and make me a robot. So he can do in me the things he wants done. I said, he's not going to take over and keep you from those girls, bro. You have to actively seek after God and resist the foolish things that you are into. God is not just going to take over and make you saved because you don't want to do the work. The Holy Spirit in the next verse, 13, says it's God that works in you. So in verse 12, he says, work out your own salvation. Complete the work of salvation in your life, but it happens through the operation and the energy of Jesus. You are cooperating with Christ for your own salvation, which means Jesus is not going to wake you up and then roll you out of bed and then prop you up in a kneeling position and make you study your Bible and then put it down. He's not going to fold your hands for you so you can pray. He's not going to have you rise up Put your socks on for you, and you're just, wow, this is kind of cool. Someone else controlling my body like you're some kind of a puppet. And then have you walk outside and begin sharing the light that you've been given with your neighbors. No, 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 no. You are the one putting forth some effort and energy and power, but it says that God is the one working in you to will and to do. That means that God is the one who is actually forming and fashioning your thoughts so that you prefer to do and choose to do the things God wants you to do, then he gives you the power and the energy to do what you have now chosen and preferred to do. God supplies the energy. He gives you the will or the choice to do what God has asked you to do. Then he gives you the power to do it. All you have to do is 
want to do it, and cooperate with the Holy Spirit. So when God calls us to do something so hard as far as reaching people who are unsaved, he's not expecting you to do it on your own. Even in Matthew chapter 28, when he's giving the Great Commission, he says, and lo, I am what? With you, even until the end of the world. He says, there's no way you're going to do this work by yourself. I don't trust you to do it without me because you can't. And even if I did, I want to hang with you because I want to see this thing happen more than you because it's my assignment I gave you, so I'm with you. Amen. He says in verse 14, do everything, do these things that God has called you to choose to do. Let me go back to verse 13 at the very end where it says, do of his good pleasure. And that is that our highest aim and goal should be to please Jesus. And when we choose to do what he is going to perform in us, it pleases the Lord. So do this without murmuring or complaining against God or disputing and fighting against him, which we have a habit of doing. Even I do that sometimes. Just, you know, battling back and forth in my head with the Holy Spirit. And eventually I, he, I always give up and cry uncle, you know. But sometimes we just have a habit of human, as human beings to dispute with God. But I encourage us to go beyond that. And he says that you may be blameless, harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of this crooked and perverse, this warped and corrupt generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Which means God is saying if there's any light in this world, the only reason it's there is because of you. This whole world, he's saying, is essentially in the midst of of darkness. And Ellen White adds this interesting quote to this, and she makes the statement that the coming of the bridegroom was at midnight, speaking of Jesus, the darkest hour. So the coming of Christ will take place in the darkest period of this earth's history. The earth has been around, we believe, it's a young earth for 6,000 years or so. And when Jesus comes again, it will be the darkest the world has ever been. The sun will still be shining, but spiritually and morally, dark. You know, there, people use this analogy quite a bit. You know, they talk about that frog, you know, proverbial frog who's in the, the little pot, and you will put on the, the heat, and it warms up gradually. If you warm it up too fast, obviously the frog's going to get hot in the water. He's going to jump out, but if you warm it up slowly, and the frog stays in there eventually until he's cooked because he does not, he adjusts to the warmth of the temperature around him. I honestly believe that we don't understand how dark this world really is. We get glimpses of it in the news. We see it in tragedies in our own families maybe. We see it maybe in our own lives. But we don't really have an understanding of it because it's been gradually getting dark around us and we don't really see it's the darkest it's ever been in the history of the world. We see the tragedies that are taking place. I read about a six-year-old boy that killed his 13-week-old sibling, beat him to death. A teenager who took advantage of and killed this little girl in his apartment complex. Civilians and police officers battling back and forth. You can see in our political situation in America, we're in darkness matter what you may have, what optimistic thoughts you have about who you might think is going to be in the White House, if you really think about it for a moment, we are a joke, and it is dark. Our education system, the militarization of our police, the big brother in the sky that's more than just you know, some pie in the sky thinking. You have time news articles talking about just how much we're being watched and tracked. Every move, every purchase, everything you do. The amount of people who are involved in the slave trade and sex trafficking. Thousands upon thousands of young girls and boys. The genocide, the war. And in the midst of that, we have bright spots like the Olympics and cute stories on television. And, and all of that just does not erase the darkness. He 
he goes on to say that light is a blessing, a universal blessing, pouring forth its treasures on a world unthankful, unholy, demoralized. So it is with the light of the sun of righteousness. The whole earth, wrapped as it is in darkness of sin and sorrow and pain, is to be lighted with the knowledge of God's love. From no sect, rank, or class of people is the light shining from heaven's throne to be excluded. The message of hope and mercy is to be carried to the ends of the earth. Whosoever will may reach forth and take hold of God's strength and make peace with him, and he will make peace. No longer are the heathen to be wrapped in midnight darkness. The gloom is to disappear before the bright beam of the Son of Righteousness. The power of hell has been overcome through Jesus. So there's no need for the world to have to remain in the darkness it's in because we as individual Christians have been called to be light. And wherever you are, darkness can't stay. But it says light is a blessing, a universal blessing. And if you're working out your own salvation with fear and trembling and you know Jesus, he's lit you on fire for the purpose of sending you into a dark world and into dark places to find people who are unsaved and unreached and bring them the knowledge of God's love the saving grace of Jesus Christ. His assignment is your assignment. And he's the one who's going to give you the ability to choose to do it and the power to do it. You don't have to muster that up yourself. I'm trying to think if I want to, how much more to share only because I want to make sure that I keep it short enough not to lose the main meat of what I want to say. Because we're almost done, actually. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 12. This will be our, this will be our last scripture. We'll end here. I'm going to share another point from the Word of God and then a really cool testimony that I have from my own experience at camp meeting. Daniel 12. And when you're there, And in Daniel 12, verse 3, and actually the preceding verses are talking about the time, in verse 1, for instance, in the middle of there, towards the end, it says, or middle, it says, you know, Jesus is going to stand up at a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. So the time in which we live, very shortly from here, there will be a time of trouble and adversity and difficulty that will reign on this earth that will be different than from every other time of trouble ever in the history of the world. Isn't it great to live in the 21st century? God chose that for you. So if you're here, it means that God knows that you're built for this. Sometimes we think, oh, I wish I lived in 1900. I lived in, no, you would have died at the age of 30 probably. <laughs> Oh, I wish I lived during Roman times or Bible times. Like, ah, you've been burned at the stake or at the Colosseum or something. Oh, I wish I lived, learned, lived during David's time, King David and the prophets. And like, well, you either would have been an idolater or an apostate Jew or the very few that actually served God. So this is the best time in Earth's history, I think. It's the most exciting and adventurous if you like action. So verse 3, it says, And they that be wise, or teachers, will shine as the brightness of the firmament. That's the sun, the moon, the stars. They that turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So during the darkest time of earth's history, there will be a people who will be shining bright like the stars. Because when you look up in the sky at night, unless you're in the city, you can see only the things that are shining. Everything else is invisible. So the only thing that will be visible during the darkest time of Earth's history, truly visible, will be us. And the Bible says that those who are wise will be in that position. And I don't have a lot of time to go through every thing that suggests what the wise people are, but the Bible does say in Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the what? beginning of wisdom. So the wise are those who have a reverence, a love and a respect for God and live for him. 
Also in Deuteronomy chapter 4, God talks, about to the, talks to the Jews and he says, you know, keeping these statutes and these laws and these, you know, uh, commandments that I've given to you, this is your wisdom in the sight of the other nations. Because they're going to see you and the way you live your life and they're going to say, wow, what great people is this that has God so near to them and has such intelligent and wise laws and, and policies and, and ways in which they live their lives and they have God right next to them. So those who keep the commandments of God and are aware of what the more responsibility we have in this world to love God and to love others, those people are considered to be wise. The Bible also says in Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30 that the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and they who win souls are wise. So you're wise if you keep the commandments of God. You're wise if you have a reverence and, and fear for God. You're wise if you know how to reach people for Jesus. Also, later on down in chapter 12 of Daniel, it talks about the fact that towards the end, only the wise will understand Daniel's writings. So you're wise if you fear the Lord, if you're keeping the commandments of God, and people can see that your life is transformed by them, and it's not a formal, rela formal religion that you have. You're wise if you're able to reach people for Jesus, and you're wise if you're studying the books of Daniel and Revelation and understanding the times that we're living in. And these people are those who will be shining during the time of earth's darkest hour, like stars in the sky, turning people to righteousness. Do you want that for yourself? And so during camp meeting, I found myself uh, praying, and I was asking God, I said, God, what can I do more for you? Because you know, every once in a while I look at this world and I see what's happening and, you know, there's, you know, a lot of people doing great things, you know, for God. I said, you know, on a, maybe a larger pedestal, a large, big time scale. And I said, Lord, what, can I do something else for you? Do you want me to, I hate Facebook, but do you want me to get on Facebook and put a quote up every day, you know, and let people know I'm actually there and not just spying on everyone else who's on Facebook? I don't really do that. But, well, kind of, but not really. Do you want me to like put up videos and, and, and try to make myself name for myself, putting up, you know, teachings and all these kinds of things like other people do? And should I, you know, go out in the middle of the street and start just preaching on a corner? What is there something bigger I can do to reach more people? And the Holy Spirit, in essence, said, look. People can come to me through media and mass media in ways in which people try to reach masses of people. He said, but you know what people really need? They need to meet individual, authentic Christians. And I started thinking about it, and the Holy Spirit kind of started unfolding this to me, and he was saying, the media and t television, and they have a version of Christianity that they push. So people sometimes have their minds made up about what a Christian is or what they think a Christian is. And sometimes we're painted to be pretty exclusive and we have a lot of walls and barriers. We've got some you know, policies and thoughts and philosophies and theology that's out of step with the rest of the world. And we're not really always painted or promoted in a great light. So God was saying people need to meet real Christians on the street and in the marketplace to give people a true understanding of what a real Christian is. They don't need to, need to see light from the television. They need to see light in front of them. He said, people need to meet people one-on-one. -on -one. I said, how in the world are we going to reach to the ends of the world one-on-one? -on -one? Well, there should be enough Christians for us to do it. Now, I believe God uses mass media. I was talking to a pastor at camp meeting and says he, you know, found himself when he became a Christian. He was a Hindu, and he became a Christian. He was watching some television program, and, you know, the, the preacher made some appeal, and he found himself getting off his couch and responding to the appeal in his living room and getting on his knees and raising his hands responding to the appeal from this television preacher. So it happens. doesn't mean that media can't save souls. God was just simply saying to me, if you want to really have an impact, you just connect with people where they are and as you meet them and try to bring them to Jesus. As a matter of fact, my wife has this cool quote where she says that the work of Christ was largely composed of personal interviews. 
Now, interview is usually when one person sits down and asks another person a question and you get an answer. And it's interesting that Jesus uses a method of inquiry with people more than, you know, what we do today. Usually we like to just shoot truth right down in there. Just boom, 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 get it in, you know. And you find Jesus ask, actually ans- asking people questions. He'd interview them about what they thought about things, which opened them up. And then eventually he'd come in and he would deposit spiritual truth into an open heart. So when you're sharing with someone, I'll just add this in in case I don't say it. I would, I would encourage you to listen more than you speak. Even James, the book of James says that. And to learn how to ask questions. And when people start to open up their hearts and minds to you, then you can not only understand where they're coming from, but now you can begin to know how best to share what you know with them. It's also said that Christ in his teaching dealt with men individually. It was by personal contact and association that he trained the 12. It was in private, often to but one listener, that he gave his most precious instruction. And it goes on. So a lot of times Jesus would just meet with people one-on-one. We see him meeting the masses and the woman who touched him in the middle of the crowd and people call coming around him, bringing their beds and their sick out from different houses. But that's, you know, the, the Bible perspective also captures the personal and private interviews Jesus would have with people. He met them one-on-one and that one person would then go reach thousands of them or hundreds. So I pray that prayer and then, long story short, we needed to wash some clothes. You're at camp meeting, you know, you get dirty. And for my job, I got really dirty because I'm out every day driving around in a cart and trying to help park people in their trailers and fifth wheels. And so we need to do laundry. And, you know, with the kids, I had to be the one to go do laundry. Now, I have to make a confession. I'm in my 30s, late her 30s, and I despise that. But I have to be thankful because some of you are older than me and you're thankful, so I have to be thankful. I can't reverse time and be younger, but I want to just stick around 33 or something, or 28, you know, for the rest of my life. Yeah. <laughs> so I have to go to the laundromat, and I have never in my life gone to the laundromat by myself. The first time I think I'd ever gone to even wash anything was with Maya, the previous camp meeting. I didn't start washing my own clothes until about 10 years ago, because people always did it for me. You know, we got a sister and a mom, and, you know, so when I moved out and lived with a cousin, they weren't going to do my laundry. So, you know, I was privileged and blessed. <laughs> so I'm, I have to go to the laundromat, and I'm, I've told you guys before, I'm an introvert. I'm very reclusive. I've learned how not to be that way, and as a pastor, you can't be that way. But I don't like going out in public very much. If I go to the store, I'm in and I'm out, but I've learned how to start talking to people and casually walking in the store and hang out and pick up my stuff instead of zooming around the, the aisles trying to get stuff as fast as I can so I can get out as fast as I can so I can get out of public and go into private. That's just how I am. That's my nature. I'm like a turtle. And so I recognized I was going to this laundromat by myself. I'd never done it before, so I'm gearing myself up for it. And I probably, I'm thinking, I said, Lord, you know, I'm learning that you want me to be open and be transparent with people, so I'm I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to reach someone and talk to someone if that's what you want from me. And so I go to the laundromat, and... I'm standing there trying to put some, you know, my laundry in and figure out this machine. And there was this lady close by, and she figured it looked like she knew what she was doing. So I started asking her, hey, do I, you know, this, and sizing it up. And she's like, yeah, you just do this, that, and the other. Long story short, we started up this conversation. The Republican National Convention was playing on television, so it was a lot of great stuff to talk about, right? So we started dialoguing about politics and world events and just the conversation was just flowing very sweetly and very beautifully. And she was a Santa Cruz native. She wasn't a crazy Santa Cruz native, but I could tell that, you know, she's probably on the liberal end of things. And, you know, but she was very nice, very cool, very cool conversation. And I was dressed, you know, I had a T-shirt on and, you know, some shorts and sandals and I'm bearded and I had my tats, you know, kind of showing. And so she she didn't expect too much of me other than I'm just a regular dude, right? And, uh, you know, so we're having this w- wonderful conversation about stuff. And every time she would say something and I would, the Holy Spirit would just give me words to speak that would take the conversation a little bit higher, a little deeper. And I can tell she was somewhat impressed and then she would come with, you know, something else. And we're just having this wonderful, beautiful, eloquent and educated dialogue about, you know, life and about what's going on in the world. And it was very cool. And towards the end, 
And the Holy Spirit said, okay, introduce the fact that you're a Christian. I said, you know, I'm a Christian, and so I believe this about, you know, world events. There's just something that she can understand and grasp. I didn't give her a study on Daniel and Revelations, you know, or anything. And then she started talking about the Ten Commandments, and she twisted them a little bit. Said, yeah, yeah, just doing the best we can for people and loving people and this, that, and the other. And the conversation started to trail off because, you know, she had to get ready to go. And I wasn't sure how she was impacted or what, but it was just a great conversation. And then I'm standing there, and I'm getting my clothes after they were done washing, and she said, was your father a minister? I said, no. He was into law, but I think he was running from the ministry. And of course, she didn't think I was by the way I was <laughs> probably dressed. And she said, well, you know, we were talking, and you weren't really trying to convert me. You weren't trying to, and she started kind of going on about something, and basically what it, the conclusion I was drawing is the Holy Spirit was convicting and converting this woman because I wasn't giving a whole lot at the very end of the conversation I said I'm a Christian we talked about the Ten Commandments and then her version of them you know about loving people and helping people and you know at the end the Holy Spirit was present in that conversation that one-on-one -on -one interview and light was shining the unfortunate part is we couldn't I couldn't get information I wasn't able to give her too much more it was just one of those brief encounters maybe 10-15 minutes of conversation before she left and I wish there was more of it, more to it, but then some, some Adventists came in, and I could tell they were Adventists because Adventists dress like Adventists, at least some of them. And I, these ladies look Adventist, you know? <laughs> I knew they were from camp meeting. And they walked in, and she was there, and we had kind of stopped our conversation, and then I was kind of thinking, okay, I want to conversate too much because I don't want them to come in and just ruin something by saying too much or whatever it is, and that's just the way I process it. And they started talking to me a little bit, and they said, oh, you must be from... We can tell you're from camp meeting. Well, you must be from a camp meeting. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe because I'm dusty and, you know, <laughs> dirty, trying to wash some clothes or I don't look like a Santa Cruz native or whatever. And again, I'm, you know, I've got my stuff on, so there's no way they would think that I'm an Adventist. I don't know. And I said, okay, yes, I am. How could you tell? And I'm thinking they're going to tell me because I'm dusty and dirty, which I don't think I was, but I figured that was it. They said, because you have this, this light, this glow and peace on your face. And for me, I, that was, I felt it was from the conversation because I just felt the Holy Spirit in that whole mix. It was a very just peaceful, wonderful experience with this lady that still walked away. I don't know what she thought about Jesus or God or whatever afterwards. I just know that God was working, and she felt it. So I share this with you, one, just to affirm the fact and put, you know, an emphasis and exclamation point on the fact that Jesus has called us to accept his appointed work, his assignment, to be lights in the world, individually to people we meet. You can't do it all. You can't fly to every country on earth and preach the gospel. It's not up to you and it's not up to me. We just do our work where we are. That's why we have a number of different lights in here. If you would just have this one light shining, this would not cover this whole church. But you've got multiple lights here, and you could probably add some more. And then you have an illuminated church because you have light shining in every different area where darkness can hide. And so God needs all of us shining somewhere in this world so that darkness is dispelled in people's lives. So I challenge you to pray the prayer and say, God, what else can I do for you? To allow God to work out salvation in you. And light you on fire to be a light to other people who are in uttermost darkness at the darkest hour in earth's history. And because it's the darkest, we need to shine as lights. And just do it in your own sphere, in your own home, in your own neighborhood. Do you accept the challenge? Be light. Shine for Jesus. I'm going to pray. And we're going to ask God to, to perform in us his will. To, and if you don't have a desire, say like you hear this and you're like, oh, I still don't want to talk to people. I don't want to share. I'd just rather be a good casual Christian. Then you just say, Lord, give me the will to choose and the power to do. So just take a moment now to connect with the Savior and pray on your own, and I'll close us with prayer.
Lord in heaven, I thank you for for your word, for the encouragement that it gives, for the fact that even when we recognize that maybe we haven't been the light that you've called us to be, that there's still time to shine. There's still the power of God that works in us, Lord God, to be lights in the world. And so, Lord God, I just pray for us if we haven't been shining, maybe we've been in darkness ourselves, we've been a part of the dark element, I pray that you would please bring Jesus into our lives and save us, Father. Through the salvation that Jesus offers completely for free, I pray that you would give us, Lord God, the oil with which you can light us on fire and that you would put us where we need to be to shine brightly for you. Lord God, put us on a pedestal. Put us where you need us to be. Send people to us, Lord, that are in darkness, that are unsaved. Give us conversations that will leave us with light and peace and a glow on our faces and a burning in our hearts to save another. Dear God, I pray that you would help us to will and to do of your good pleasure. And your greatest pleasure is to see human beings saved. Lord God, I want to be a part of that. Help me in my own weakness and de- my own defects to be greater and better for you. And help us all together to be the same. I pray for our young people that they too would choose this. That they would be lights where they are in their schools and in their jobs. And for those who are aged members, that they too, Lord God, would bear fruit for you. I thank you for using us. I thank you even this week for sending us people that you want in your kingdom. And put your love in our hearts, Father. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.